bringing you a different show this time. We went to Woodstock to interview Keith Helmuth and Daryl Hunter on a book they collaborated on about Tap and Adney. As you watch the show, you're going to see some magic happen because Mr. Adney is a huge influence on our province and our relations with First Nations. We did the interview through visiting different locations where Mr. Adney um, had left his mark and we also did it in Connell House where the Tappan Adney Room played host to us in our conversation about the Birch Bark Canoe, New Brunswick and a Renaissance man. So thanks for coming and doing all this. So we get to tell the story of Tappan Adney and maybe one of the best places to start is that Mr. Adney came up here from the States. So in a way, he's a come from away. New Brunswick has a long history of, of come from away, <laughs> come from away. Um, so what brought him up here? What, what brought Mr. Adney up? Well, uh, his, his uh, mother had a boarding house in New York, in Manhattan, and Minnie Bell Sharp from Upper Woodstock came to New York as a music student and boarded at this boarding house, and that's where they met. And actually, um, his, uh, his sister, Tappan Adney's sister, and Tappan Adney were invited to come to New Brunswick, to Upper Woodstock, for a summer holiday by, by uh, Minnie Bell. And uh, so that's what uh, initially brought them to New Brunswick. All right. So it was for love. Uh, probably not yet. <laughs> <laughs> not initially. <laughs> Did that happen later? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was always questionable if there ever was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. the shadow side she, of the she relationship. She was years older than him. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean anything. But yeah. 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 So, uh, Tappan Edney's sister went back after the summer holiday and Tappan Edney stayed. Hmm. Stayed for 18 months. Uh, although uh, he was supposed to be enrolled at Columbia University and had been preparing for that, mm -hmm. but decided to not go back and enroll in the university and stay, stayed here because he became so interested with what he saw here, both in terms of the wilderness environment and the cultural uh, effects that he saw, particularly with the Maliseet people, and he saw the birch bark canoe being built. He was an artist, he was a natural naturalist and an, an ornithologist. There were so many things that attracted him in this environment yep. that he started to research. Every, everywhere he went he was a researcher and an artist doing sketches and absorbing the the uh, things that he saw and re re recording them. So uh, that really got him engaged uh, and he stayed for 18 months, went back and then went back and forth numbers of times during the successive years. He referred to uh, seeing Peter Joe building a birch bark canoe out of, the, out, out of the products from the forest as a pivotal moment in his life that affected everything he did from that point on in his life. One of those moments of epiphany, right? right? Yeah. We often don't get those in our lives where we just know in that moment, boom, I'm supposed to be here now and this is what I'm supposed to do. That's what seemed to happen to him, yeah. yeah. Well, but that's an important route because that becomes why Tappan Adney is so important to New Brunswick's history and the history of Mounsey First Nations peoples too. Um, so where should we go from there? Because he's moved up for love, sort of, maybe, maybe not. Um, but he became part of the fabric of this area and of the province. Well, he, he did, and he really sort of engaged with the whole family, the Sharp family. Uh, Francis Peabody Sharp was a, was a prominent orchardist and nurseryman who was responsible for breeding apple varieties that could be grown in this area and that was kind of an innov innovation uh, and so um, there was a son in that family Humboldt Sharp that Adney became fast friends with and they went off on all kinds of wilderness expeditions hunting canoeing uh, and there's a whole lot in his journals about that so the engagement with the Sharp family beyond just Minnie Bell was a really important factor that got him engaged in, in uh, hmm. and coming, coming back and forth between New York and here over the years. This is uh, into Sharp's property. His property was way over in there. This, this was the road, the pathway into Sharp's foundation, way down over in there. And if you remember, in the book, there's a picture, which is this sort of three-story stockade-looking look, type house, which is all clear. 
except for a few trees, but this is all cleared land here where the house is sitting down in that area. And Humboldt Sharp also was a friend of Peter Joe that was making the canoes, and Peter mm -hmm. Joe would take them hunting out around Ayers Lake, hunting caribou, and showing them the, the, the different ways of making different kinds of traps and things out of the forest for catching, not just for not shooting caribou, but for yeah. trapping other things. And uh, so Adney was just so fascinated about, one of the big things that he really, uh, it seemed to captivate him was, was going to the forest and getting everything you needed out of the forest without having to go to a, a, a local store and, and buying things. They did just make what they needed out of the forest. So yeah. he, he and Humboldt and Peter Joe, uh, for a long time, spent a lot, a lot of uh, trips and journeys out through the wilderness here, but also up around the Tobique and, and clear up to uh, Quebec, up to Lake mm -hmm. Temescuata in Quebec. And it's, it just, that his journals that he, he kept, that's another aspect that this book sort of supplements and, you know. And one of the things that became really clear to me in, in working on this project is that he was always a researcher because all this information that he gleaned from his experiences here, he began to translate into written work uh, for magazine articles in New York. Uh, he began giving presentations, so he developed a whole career of, of researching the information about wilderness living and particularly with the building the birch bark canoes and other kind of material cultural aspects of the Maliseet and then giving talks in New York and in the associated areas of the, of the East Coast because at that time there was a huge interest in this type of information. So you would have a big crowd gathered to hear a talk about some aspect of the wilderness in, in Canada that Adney was now becoming really familiar with. And so for a number of years he built a career uh, of giving these presentations, writing articles, a lot of artwork. He, he was commissioned to do artwork for various publications. Uh, so for the first uh, maybe 10 years, he was back and forth between New Brunswick and New York in this kind of career mode, researching and then giving these presentations in, in areas that were paying him to actually yeah. uh, uh, do it. So. Good. And, and somewhere tied to all of that too that you capture in the book is um, a frustration because he didn't have formal certification, education, didn't have degrees, and yet the amount of work he did would be the equivalent of several degrees. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and in several different disciplines yeah. too. So in a way he was very much a, oh, what's the phrase, not a romantic, but there's a, a person who's well rounded and does many things very well. And, and doesn't fit any one particular category or box. Or yeah, that was a problem with him in later years too because he never did finish a lot of things because he got an, int an interest in this over here and then that over there and he'd yeah. chase this for a while and chase that and he, he just was a man that had many interests. Yeah. Renaissance man, that's what a I was Renaissance, saying. Renaissance man. man. And because his orientation was research, when something perked his interest, <laughs> he would follow it up even though something over here maybe hadn't been completed yet. Yeah. So his major his major book, The uh, Bark Canoes and Skin Boats of North America, was actually not published until 1964. Mm. He died in 1950. Mm. And so all the manuscripts, all the materials that he put together that eventually became that, that book were preserved uh, and eventually published by the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. Mm. as a major document of the material culture and, and anthropology of North America because it covered the whole scope. Uh, after he started uh, researching and building the model canoes and, and, and documenting the construction here, he actually continued to do that right across North America and into the far north. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's the bark canoes and skin boats of North America. And when that book uh, was put together uh, by Howard Chappelle at the Smithsonian, uh, Chappelle himself had a lot of experience with the skin boats of the Inuit, the far far north, and so he was able to add a certain amount of that material to the end of the book to make it a complete uh, document of all those types of, of boat building styles and, and uh, designs right, right across the, the continent. Mm -hmm. he, it's interesting that Adney, uh, he, throughout his whole history, he all at the bottom, what was the foundation of everything he did, 
was to do with the First Nations peoples. He was the first person to publish uh, the Maliseet uh, Natural History uh, in 1889, I believe it was. He, he published uh, uh, a Maliseet Natural History where he lists different birds and animals and what the Maliseets called them. And uh, <coughs> Montague Chamberlain in 1899, uh, that many years later, he published one here in New Brunswick. But when Adney went to the Klondike Gold Rush and, and published the Klondike Stampede, he took two months off to go hunting with the Trochutan Indians, hmm. as, as they were called back then. And uh, those ones recently run a, won a Supreme Court uh, uh, ruling on and their rights to, to in, in their lands that they have out there in British Columbia. So mm. that's the same group. And Adley, mm. he couldn't resist. He took time <laughs> off on his own. He wasn't paid to do this. Yeah. To go, he hunted, uh, hunted with them for two months in the middle of the winter <laughs> in what rather uh, uh, rough conditions up there in the backlands of and, Klondike. And all the time documenting the experience. Yeah. Including with drawings and paintings. Eventually, he did paintings of those experiences. There's sketches so, right in this room. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, uh, so we're talking about something from a hundred years ago and a bit more. Yeah. It's still relevant today. I'm thinking of the relationships with First Nations. I'm capturing history so that you know where you came from. Um, why, why did he build the model canoes? He, uh, he built the model canoes because he wanted to preserve, not just in written form and drawings, he wanted to preserve in actual mm -hmm. material form the exact details of construction. So he built them at one-fifth scale, mm -hmm. which was large enough that he could use the same materials that they would be used to build a full-scale canoe mm -hmm. and show every detail of construction. Uh, at least that's, that's my understanding. The one thing right. that makes his book about the, uh, the skin boats and bark canoes uh, more valuable is that his model supplemented. So the book, it's one thing to, to put in writing how to, build, how to build a canoe or pictures and sketches, but if you have the model made out of the actual same material, he, he, didn't, uh, he didn't use something else to make these things with, he used the actual materials and everything was one-fifth scale. So uh, you had the book, and then you can go and look at the models. And the, the Mariners Museum has 110 of his models. And uh, here in New Brunswick, we've got a few of them too, in the New Brunswick Museum and the York Sunbury, or the York uh, Fredericton Regional Museum. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, that made it one without the other, it wasn't as valuable. Put the two together, and you've got a piece of history, mm -hmm. a piece of culture. Yeah. And in reality, it's the actual material. It's, it's an artifact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the estimate is he built probably close to 150 of, of those models overall? Well, I was, well, Ted Bainey, when I was working with him on that, we had come up to 151 mm -hmm. that we had found and identified. And, and some of that, we never saw them, but we, like the Mar not the Mariners Museum, but the American Museum of Natural History had a couple there, and we, could, we didn't see them, but we, we uh, actually saw them on, on the web and know that they're there. Uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt Library has one that he, that he made there, so, yeah. Yeah, so the significance of that in terms, and you mentioned what is a contemporary significance, but the, the importance of the preservation of, of that material culture and, and all the, the cultural aspects that surround it, the, the social aspect of that type of building of a canoe, as I understand it, it wasn't just like an individual canoe builder doing this, but it was a collective effort uh, that, that really went into building these tools. I mean, they were tools that they needed to live on the river. Uh, and so to preserve that, it really gives a, a picture of what life was like at that time, which was already a transition from the older days, but it still preserved so many of the skills and techniques, mm. which uh, to us looking at, you know, uh, how could you learn to do something like that? But at that time, it was just the natural progression of their cultural heritage that the Maliseet people were continuing with. And, and Adney, Adney saw that and realized how important that was and set about systematically to preserve that. And then he went into the language research and other aspects of the material culture. So his, his contribution to preserving that, that um, 
era and those skills of that culture. Uh, I don't know if there's anything comparable to it, but it, it seems to be to a really important aspect of, of um, anthropological preservation in general, but material cultural preservation for Canada in particular. He studied the uh, Maliseet language and at the Peabody Essex Museum uh, in Massachusetts, there are thousands of his typewritten pages of the Maliseet language and where it's important is that he was, he was, uh, his, one of his main uh, contributors to his research was Peter Paul, Dr. Peter Paul of the Woodstock Nation because Peter was raised by his grandparents who spoke the old hunter-gatherer mm -hmm. language of the Maliseet people, and so, which is different than the modern-day language. And so uh, Adney and Peter uh, were connected together for a lot of years and, and in Adney's research on, on their language. And, uh, of course, he was never given any recognition. He dealt with people like uh, Ganon and uh, uh, down in Maine uh, there was... Uh, uh, was the one did the Penobscot spec mm -hmm. was yeah, the one down there yeah. and uh, so these people looked at him as a kind of a rival but insignificant because he's got no qualifications yeah that, that, and that burned him it, 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 it goes back to what you mentioned earlier that he was very skilled yeah. uh, sort of naturally intuitively skilled at yeah. a lot of these things that people get PhDs in order to work at, he, he could do, but he didn't have that degree. And so that kind of dogged him his whole life uh, because he knew, he, he knew he knew what he was doing. Yeah. <laughs> and yet he wasn't getting the recognition from the professional gatekeepers to the, you know, at, at that time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of people in history that are like that. Yeah. That we can yeah. place Mr. Adney in that same category where here's the standard and here's the process. And then there's people outside of that that are creating the huge shifts in thinking, the huge shifts in perception. Um, I was, and that's where the breakthroughs yeah. come from, it's from outside of that. He was an artist. I mean, that sort of was his temperament in, in, in a certain respect, as well as a, well as a researcher. Yeah. And so he was impatient, I think, with, with jumping through the hoops that you would necessarily have to do to, yeah. to qualify in the eyes of the establishment. So here's the direction I'd like to take it. And we're talking about history, and we're starting to map out um, why some of it um, is important to remember, but how do we get to apply it to today? So building of a birch bark canoe in 2017 is important, like why? Or is it just about the birch bark canoe? Or is it about how that canoe came into being? Because there was one recently recreated, wasn't there, in the past oh, two or oh, three well, years? Well, yeah, there's a, there's a whole story which Daryl knows a lot about, but let me just give a first introduction yeah. from my, my perspective. Um, I visited the Mariner's Museum a number of years ago where uh, 110 of his canoes are, are there. They have about maybe 25 on display at any one, one time. And it's just stunning. I mean, when you see them uh, in this setting, uh, the, the beauty of them, uh, to, to me, the, the preservation of that visual experience aesthetically is is really profound uh, and I think that first of all in my mind is so important to have preserved in, in and now people are building them there have been nine built in the St. John River in the St. John River watershed yeah. including Maine including Maine, Maine, Maine. In, in the last decade or, or, or so yeah, yeah definitely yeah. Steve, yeah. Steve Kayard who lives in New Hampshire uh, is the person who has been primarily the the workshop leader, uh, been, been conducting workshops and helping groups of people build these canoes. So in 2012, there was a workshop here that Daryl was involved with and mm. made a film of. So uh, that's that's one canoe, and we can see that later today. It's on display out at the Eagle's Nest. Yeah. Uh, Daryl Paul, uh, Peter Paul's son was the organizer of that event. It was, what, two weeks or a month it took to do that project? I think it was five weeks. For five weeks, yeah. They built a long house to, so it was enclosed and the workshop was inside there and they did the whole thing. It's well documented. Uh, that was a 19-foot canoe. And then in uh, 2015, 2016, Daryl Paul's son, Peter Paul's grandson, 
built another one, a 13 foot, all on his own in his shop. And if we have time, we have a chance to see that one to, to the midday too. So this, this renaissance of, of canoe building has taken place uh, principally out of Adney's record. People that do this have his book open on their workshop table. Uh, and I remember one expression, I think it was in the film that you made, Daryl, where uh, one of the women who was involved in doing this workshop and building the, the canoe or being, being present talked so movingly about the experience of, of this canoe coming to life and the feeling of connection with the ancestors that it gave her. I mean, it's, it's really a moving, moving piece. So that's part of why it's important for the Maliseet, but then important for us to understand what it means to them and how we're, how we're increasingly connected in, in, in Canada with, with the First Nations cultures as um, an attempt to, to bring into full recognition the contribution of, of all the cultures that make up, make up the nation, basically. I, I think there's an expression that says the, uh, the spirit of the forest is in the canoe. Yeah, and if you, uh, if you ever attend a workshop, you don't go to a workshop room and then someone says, now here's some spruce roots and here's some birch bark and you put it all together and we'll show you how, you know, we'll teach you. No, you've got to go to the forest, you've got to find the right birch tree if you can find any. They're getting scarce now because they're, they're going to the pulp mills or the paper mills or whatever. And uh, so you have to gather the spruce roots, you have to get the, the pitch to make the, 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 the rosin which is used to seal the, the seams on the canoe. Everything, you have to gather your cedar, uh, and then you have to know what to do. You have to bend the ribs. You have to steam them and bend them. You've got to make the ribs and steam them and bend them. And I uh, messed up a couple because if, if someone, <laughs> if someone has worked really hard at getting those all carved out, they're just straight at first off, you know, but there, a lot of work goes into it. It's all handmade. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then you steam it, take that time, and then you got to bend it over your knee properly. If you bend a little bit too far the wrong way, you put a little pinch in there, chuck it. <laughs> it's so it. easy to do. That was the voice of experience. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. But that, that the point being is that if you build a canoe, yeah. you learn a lot about the forest, you'll mm -hmm. learn about what time of year to go and gather your bark, you just don't go out any time. Everything, you learn so much out of that exercise. I found out some, some of my family history in particular, my uh, my great grandmother uh, Sarah, uh, who happened to pass in 1902, uh, giving birth to uh, my grandfather and his twin brother. Uh, the twin brother had also passed, and uh, she was uh, racing birch bark canoes in the St. John River, uh, six months pregnant uh, with my uh, grandfather and, and his twin. I decided I'd dedicate uh, one of my panels to, to her, in memory of her. Uh, she was only 16 when she had passed. So I thought that was uh, a pretty nice touch for some historical significance. Thank you for sharing and teaching us all that because there might be some in the audience because um, we have such a consumer culture now so they're going to consume the television show as well um, that it's more than just about a canoe and it's more than just about a gentleman who moved here and fell in love with this place from New York up into Woodstock, New Brunswick because it interlaces and why his story seems to be so powerful is it interlaces so many aspects that it's hard to get your head around because there's so much to it but when you start to hear the pieces and put it together realize it, it's a phenomenon of sorts of gathering all this information, being the artist and being the ethnographer and the archaeologist and anthropologist and, and building the models so you not only are an artist on paper but you're an artist in 3D and passing on legacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there, can you speak to the fact that he's a white man from New York whose legacy now helps Maliseet First Nations remember um, part of their process and part of their history? Or is that appropriate? That, that somehow this is all supposed to interweave? Well, one of the, one of the things that's probably equally important to the building of the Birchmark Canoes is that Adney became a real advocate 
for the Maliseet people vis-a-vis uh, -vis the dominant society around him. And, and in his later years, uh, he lived in Montreal for a period of time and then came back to Upper Woodstock. And, and when he came back, uh, he, became, he became so engaged with the First Nations community, his friends, uh, and, and understanding and being, um, being their voice, in a sense, in various kinds of political, political situations. Uh, and, and he did that at the expense of his own work. Mm -hmm. His canoe book was not finished when he died right. because he, he felt it was more important to devote his time and energy that he ha had left to working for justice for his Maliseet friends. Mm -hmm. So that gives you an insight into sort of where his priorities really were and came to be, especially near, you know, at, at the end of his life over the last several decades. Um, and, and that's another aspect of his story, which, which we talk about in, in, in the book. Um, and and I, I think um, is he he was recognized um, by the particularly some of the leaders in the Malasi community up and down the, the valley Tobique and, and here as as being a true friend of the Malasi when many other people in the community weren't particularly friendly he somehow he he. Uh, he transcended that barrier and was really accepted. And there's some really moving testimonies by, by people that were uh, speaking about his relationship to their community and how he helped them. Uh, Daryl knows a lot about this too. <laughs> he was the first one to dig out a treaty of 1725, blow the dust off it. He got a copy of it in uh, Massachusetts archives and uh, go, go to bat to say, uh, this treaty, there's rights you should have, and it's just gathering dust. No one's paying attention to it. So a lot of people don't like him for that, because look what has happened since then. That was back in the 1930s, 40s, along there, particularly in the 1940s. And uh, so he started on his own campaign, writing letters to newspapers, to editors, and he sent over 40 briefs to Ottawa, uh, saying they need to change the Indian Act. And uh, he, was, he was really active in that area. He didn't get a lot of success because, again, who's he yeah. to be doing this? Yeah. And, uh, but they did set up a committee to, to look at the Indian Act because he, they, they felt that if they didn't, he wasn't going to stop. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> he was the, that squeaky wheel out there, so let's do something to say yeah. we're paying attention. So you create a committee or do a study and that will delay a process. But the different things he wanted changed, uh, I think in 1951 they did change the Act. I may be wrong on that date, but anyway, when they did, it, wasn't the, and he, it was the year after he died, so he never saw the changes made. And, what, and the changes that were made weren't what he had hoped to see. So maybe it's a good thing he didn't mm -hmm. see them. But. And, and one of the things, as I understand it, about that treaty of 1725, what was it, mm -hmm. that, that came to light uh, is that there had never been any ceding of the land, of the territory, in any formal sense. There, it was a peace and friendship treaty which had all kinds of understandings about how the land and the resources were to be shared among the people that now lived here. So there was no 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 formal treaty of handing over the land to the and so that that's right now an extremely important aspect of how the political negotiations are going on between Ottawa, the Canadian government, and the First Nation peoples. Uh, so that's very very current and more more information <coughs> on, on that treaty has since come to light, which reinforces that particular framework of never having ceded the land. Yep. There's so much more <coughs> known now about treaties than there ever was, and mm -hmm. it all goes back to Adney yeah. starting the ball rolling. Yeah. That's why it's important. That's why, yeah. And um, wouldn't it be interesting, too, if some of that language can make its way into present day? So when you said understandings, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, imagine integrating that in today's language. So instead of making contracts and sense of ownership or proprietary, it's just a set of agreements and understandings. So maybe the old ways can help us with our current day struggles. That's an interesting thought. That's what I'm trying to bridge. Yeah, yeah. I, I hadn't quite thought about it in that way, but uh, rather than the, the uh, 
the way we're used to thinking of property rights, for ex example. I mean, in New Brunswick now, we have a vast amount of crown land, yes. right? land held by the crown in trust for the people, you know, whoever's here. And yep. the original people, of course, would sort of have priority <laughs> rights to that crown, crown land. Well, yeah. in terms of timber harvest, in terms of forest management right now, in terms of mining, uh, Projects. That's a current, a current issue. Yeah. And to bring it right into present day and connecting the past and its its heart with present day, because it helps us find our heart again, using the word understandings, uh, respecting the, the history, but also in several places you can find and read that some of the challenges we face, um, the solutions are going to be found in our First Nations philosophy mm -hmm. rather than a white man philosophy or a European central philosophy because of climate change, because of mm. systemic changes that are going on with uh, banking or environmental systems or financial systems mm -hmm. or political systems. Mm -hmm. um, there's a big shift that's uh, in play right now where things are starting to dissemble and it needs to be recreated out of the chaos. In a different way than we have been operating because the way we've been operating has created a lot of deterioration in, in the things that we need to sustain. Yeah. That's it. That's, so, that's an interesting uh, observation. I've read many places yeah. where First Nations will be, once we reconnect with that soul, that it'll be how we get out of the, the current situation we're in. So when you said understanding mm -hmm. someone, yeah, you just go back to mm -hmm. the simple shared understanding and it'll get you through some complex time. So Mr. Adney has a, a huge impact historically, but some of his lessons and teachings might carry up into the present. So you framed up Mr. Adney lovely for us. Can you share a bit about what it was like writing the book? I know that could take oh, about yeah. 10 hours. <laughs> sure. sure, that's <laughs> but, an interesting uh, story. You but know, you know, a lot of people don't get a chance to write a book, and yeah. you've got one done, yeah. and Daryl has the long history of how even some of it has come to be. Yeah. And, yeah. and that process is important. Well, uh, sure, I'd be glad to talk a little bit about that. Um, I first saw Adney's book, The, uh, the Bark, Canoes, and Skin Boats of North America, in 1969, a few years after it was published. A, a colleague of mine at a college where I was teaching had the book open on his table in his living room because he was planning the canoe trip across Canada and planning to build canoes. Well, he wasn't planning to build birch bark can canoes. But uh, this, this book was an inspiration to him and to the students that were working with him. Uh, and then in, um, in uh, the early 70s, uh, my family and I moved to New Brunswick. And uh, lo and behold, we moved to Woodstock, where Tappan Adney was actually located. And we shortly thereafter met his granddaughter, who has a cottage on Skiff, Skiff Lake. Tappan Adney's son, Glenn, had maintained a cottage here in New New, New New Brunswick, and she lives in Florida. She comes up in the summer for a couple of weeks, uh, and uh, otherwise she rents the cottage out or has it used in other ways. And she asked my wife and I, Ellen, if we would be willing to be sort of the caretakers for the cottage. So we did that for maybe ten years or so at, at least. So we got really well acquainted with the Adney story through our acquaintance with uh, Joan, uh, his uh, granddaughter. The first time we stayed at the cottage, we in the upstairs bedroom area, we go in there and there's a model canoe <laughs> on, on the table. I didn't know a whole lot at that time about that, but I, I recognized it. His typewriter was there. I didn't know it was his typewriter, but there was an old, old typewriter there. Uh, the portraits of Minnie Bell uh, and, and Adney that are here, reproductive, <coughs> in this room, the originals were hanging on the wall of the stairs as you walked upstairs. So it was quite an at atmosphere. Um, and, and then, so I just began to know a lot more about the story. Then, uh, about a year ago, a year and a half, half ago, a number of people, uh, the, the uh, president of the Carlton County Historical Society, John Thompson, the mayor of Woodstock, Art Slip, uh, and Daryl was involved, came to us as a small publishing company based here and said, we need a book about Tappan Adney. This, this major biography is in process. It's been in process a long time. We're not sure when it's going to be published. It's going to be a massive book. We would like something that's fairly brief, well illustrated, that tells the Adney story that could be more generally available. So uh, Daryl, uh, I learned, had this vast amount of research available. I've done a fair amount of writing in my, my life. I knew the story pretty well. 
Daryl hands me a 26-page outline of Tampa and Abney's life, chronologically, all the major details of his life. So I say, well, there's, there's, my, there's my outline. So I sat down and blocked out the chapters that told the story of the major events of, of his life, many of which we haven't even talked about yet, because he was an artist in many other respects as well. Yeah. Um, and so I, I began, to, began to write to those, those identified chapters. Daryl provided access to the illustrations, the archives, the research, and my son, the graphic artist, and, and Daryl put all this together in the book that we now have. So uh, once we got started, it didn't take that long because the material uh, and the knowledge was sort of right, right there. And I got, I got kind of carried away with it. I just got so interested in producing this book that writing wasn't that hard. <laughs> I, I must say it was really enjoyable, yeah. largely because working with Daryl Every time I had a question, I could turn to Daryl and I could find the answer, or he knew where the information yeah. was. The, the one thing that was interesting that I turned up on my own in the, in the research is that, is that the people that um, befriended him from the Mariner's Museum, um, the Hills, what was, the, what was his first Fred name? Fred Nola. Fred Nola Hill. Uh, uh, they were the ones responsible for making the purchase of the Adney canoe models, which had been stored in Montreal at McGill, uh, not on display, just in a dusty st storeroom. They saw them and knew what the value of them was, arranged to purchase them, uh, but at the same time uh, wanted to help Adney finish the book. And so they actually supported him financially with a stipend for maybe 10 years, as well as a lot of personal support. Well, it turns out they're Maritimers. They were running this museum in New, New Virginia. Fred was from, from uh, St. John and Nola was from Halifax. And so that little piece of research I turned up helped to explain why they took such an interest and why they, they went out of their way to support Adney to help him do the work that he was still, still uh, doing. So that's, that's uh, sort of how the book came, it came together. Yeah, and you're speaking of uh, Fred Noah Hill. When they met him at Grand Central Station, they they asked, they brought him down by train, and they, they wanted to meet with the people at the Mariners Museum. To, to you know, Eddie, you've got to get onto this book. You've got to get it finished. Then. Stop yeah. looking after those Indians back there and focus on your book. Yeah. yeah. Adney met them at Grand Central Station, and he. Uh, <laughs> He had a, Nola describes it, I can't remember how she described it, I remember basically he had a coonskin hat on that was three sizes too small for him. He had a Mackinac on, I think she said, which had how many types of soup spilt down it on, on and he had the Mackinac uh, misbuttoned, it wasn't buttoned in the right order, and where there were buttons that were missing, he had put nails in there to hold it on. And it just, you just think about that. Uh, this is the man which is, uh, a lot of people call the genius. Yeah. And uh, he, never, he never worried about how he looked. In fact, she says in that he walked down b along the tracks where the trains were and people were in the station there, looked at him and he was quite proud. She said the way he was walking, it looked like he really enjoyed everybody looking at him. <laughs> so. <clears throat> This, this was in the latter years of his life, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, there are other images of him earlier in life in, in, which, in which he was, you know, dressed in a very different, different way. But as, as he aged and as he was absorbed in the work that he was doing, other things, I think, in terms of, of yeah. those details of tidiness or whatever, just kind of fell away. So he got, an, he got a reputation as being a real eccentric yeah. here in the Woodstock area and I guess where else where, where he went, went yeah. to, but... It, have you ever eaten in the Champlain dining room at Chateau Frontenac? No. Well, good, if you can afford to. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the, the, go the, the, there the, the, the pillars in that huge dining room yeah. all have shields on them. There's over 40 shields, carved shields. And over the, over the, the fireplace, there's a huge shield. I think it's the one with Champlain's ship on it, but it's all about different French, very important French people who founded uh, sure. New, New France yes. and their history of the families. Adney carved all those. Really? In 1929, he was hired to do all that because as part of his research into Maliseet history and the Europeans coming here, he, he got into family lines. He got into the lines of the St. Aubans and, 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 yep. the, and those other 
French people who came down, came here first and uh, settled. And then so he got into heraldry. He became a heraldry expert and we even carried a card around. And, he, and we have here at the, at the uh, Connell House uh, huge uh, uh, charts of heraldry that uh, they're like 15 feet long here. And it's uh, just one more of his directions, but it all, it all connected, it all tied in yeah, yeah. to what he was doing. And the, the, the discovery of those carved shields is fairly recent in terms of people knowing that he actually did them. Uh, in what year was it when uh, the publisher of the Woodstock Jubal was there? At the that was around 2010. Two, 2010. Uh, What's his name, the publisher? Dave Henley. Dave Henley, the publisher of the, of the Bugle at that time. He and his wife were eating there, and he noticed this little plaque that said that these shields were carved by Tapp and Adney. And so he reports that back. Nobody had known that. Nobody doing Adney research before this, not even the biographers who were deep into Tapp and Adney, knew that he had done these 40 shields, a major, major piece of artistic work. So that was a recent discovery. So our question is, how many more things out there might there be that he did that are still to be discovered? Yeah. <laughs> and the New Brunswick Museum uh, has, he has models of not just canoes, but he's got all the different traps and tools that the Maliseets used. So you can actually see how they were made, what they were made of. Yeah. And, uh, and it's back to him saying, they had a high standard of simplicity. They could go to the forest and here's what they would make. And, and they survived for 10,000 years. Yeah. Without guns and gunpowder and all the things we brought to them to make life easier. Yeah, yeah which was the opposite <laughs> and, effect. And, and when, when you th think about it, those, those skills, those skills of the old hunter-gatherer culture, uh, you know, in some ways carry over. A, a lot of people are still very connected with the woodland and the, the type of activities and the resources that you get there on a sort of personal basis. But, but the ability to actually survive with the technology they had and survive in a pretty good way um, is, is when we think about, we couldn't do that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, what are the recurring we, themes? And we're in a much more fragile situation vis-a-vis -vis survival. Yes. If anything you know, goes wrong, then they would have been. They, they, well, that's connecting one of the dominant themes of today is that we import 90% of our food. Yeah. Um, we don't know how to feed ourselves. We don't know how to sustain ourselves. And it, it might be there's a new version of the First Nation way that Mr. Adney might have captured or your storytelling is wonderful helping us remember that that'll help us move forward. Well, as well as yeah, it, yeah. there's a soul element to all of this too. As you talk with so much enthusiasm and knowledge about this gentleman, it's very clear he was listening to his soul's journey. Mm -hmm. There was something constantly pulling him through in a yeah. certain direction, which is why he took the risks he took or the decisions he mm -hmm. made. Mm -hmm. and, and it was connected to land, it was connected to First Nations people, and it was connected to recording or capturing and mm -hmm. making beautiful the artworks. That mm -hmm. make and beautiful. it was about self-sufficiency. Yeah. yeah. You don't go to Walmart to get everything. <laughs> Yeah, and, and we're, we, we might be on the cusp of the next 50 years of needing to remember those values. Not necessarily the processes, because technology has is, is made its way completely in. Mm -hmm. But the value that drives that, maybe we yeah, can nexus. It's, it's not a matter of going back necessarily to the old ways, but incorporating the values and, mm -hmm. the, and the, the new innovations in a way that rebuilds the kind of sustainability that they enjoyed in their in their, in their life. and maintains yeah. the balance yeah because yeah. we need to do some yeah. major healing yeah you know, first with first nations peoples and then with our relationship with land yeah. and then with each other and it sounds like mr adney had a <clears throat> he can teach us a lot about yeah. that another interesting aspect that that uh emphasized in in the book aside from all these creative and preservation skills that, that, that he had um, at a certain point uh, when he and Minnie Bell came back to Upper Woodstock, they'd been in New York for a period of time, they came, he came back and uh, they took over the orchard business that Francis Peabody Sharp had built up and was beginning to fail. It was, I think Francis Peabody Sharp was already gone at that time. 1903 he died. Yeah, he, he, he died. And, and a couple of the family members tried to carry it on and it wasn't doing too well. Minnie Bell and, and, and Tapa Andy came back and for 10 years 
that's a long period of time, 10 years they devoted themselves to try to revive and make that orchard business a viable business again. So I think about this man with all these skills yeah. for that period of time, devoting himself to an entirely different kind of enterprise. Yeah. Uh, that that uh, that really rings a bell with me because I've been a farmer in my past life too, yeah. <laughs> and that's I know what what it takes to do <laughs> that kind of work as yeah. as an orchardist in particular. And so that's a whole other aspect. When he decided to do something, he really devoted himself to it. It didn't work out. The business did fail. Um, and he founded he, the he Carlton County Fruit Growers Association and published books on how to grow apples. Yeah, all during that time he was still doing the kind of research that he was prone to, but trying to make the, the, the business go too. Yeah. So there's so many aspects to yeah. his, his... And, and just so the audience can have a, a sense of it, how big was this orchard? <laughs> oh, goodness. Uh, <laughs> which one? The, the one that Sharp's was, orchards? Yes. Yeah. Well, well, for his day and age, uh, Mr. Sharp had the largest commercial orchards in North America. There you go. And nowadays that wouldn't be so because mm -hmm. no one was there. Everybody just had a little small, what they used to call a kitchen orchard, just yeah. a small little orchard, 10, 12 trees. Yeah. And there was no commercial orchards. He had about 100 acres. Uh, a lot of it was in Upper Woodstock up here. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had something like 70,000 trees or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he was using his methods to keep the trees small, dwarf sized. But uh, uh, it was. We know what Mr. Trump's doing today with his protectionism in the States. Well, President McKinley, <laughs> back in those days, uh, decided to do the same thing. And he put a big tariff on apples, and Mr. Sharp was shipping 18,000 barrels of apples to the States every year. And he had borrowed money from L.P. Fisher here, who, was the, who loaned people money as a mortgager. And, uh, and Sharp had a lot of debt but he was meeting. He was. He's meeting yeah. his, his, this debt uh, to Mr. Fisher. He, and uh, but when that tariff came down, uh, seventy-five cents a barrel, and the barrels were of two dollars of apples. Uh, within a very few years, Mr. Sharp had. He he couldn't find any more. He he was originally shipping to places in Canada, and Nova Scotia, and uh, and even out west. But he. Those weren't enough to keep going for that 18,000 barrels of apples. Yeah. So his industry failed, and uh, Mr. McKinley was executed. He was shot. He was assassinated, I should say, not executed. That wrong word. He was assassinated. <laughs> so I don't know if that's called, if the history repeats itself or not. But <laughs> yeah, but interesting to have that little footnote yeah. because that sets up the challenge Mr. Adney took on with taking on the orchard. Yeah, and orchard I think when they came in, when Minnie Bell and Tap Adney came back, the orchard was quite a bit smaller, wasn't it, at that time? It, it, it diminished quite a lot. Uh, well, yeah, it was sold to uh, an orchardist in Nova Scotia who, Mr. Sharp was an experimenter and he had 1,800 trees that were in, in process of, of experimentation and this grower cut them all down because they weren't, he didn't really care about them. He, he wanted varieties that were going to sell. Mm -hmm. and these were unknown varieties because they are all experimental. Mm -hmm. So he cut them all down and that really got tap and add and you go on. He was very, very upset about that. So um, to bring this back to Mr. Adney and you're writing the book mm -hmm. and doing history on the book and we have uh, about a minute or two okay. left. How, how do you want to wrap up um, this segment of the conversation? Um, maybe the context would be what Final thought: Would you like um, New Brunswickers to have about this key figure in our past that, with any luck, comes to play a role in our present? Well, I, what I would like to do, and, and what I'm sort of committed to in terms of our little publishing company, um, is to create a growing appreciation, uh, a growing awareness and appreciation of the place where we live, of of the St. John River Valley the things that have happened here, the things that are happening here now, the, the natural history and the cultural heritage. Uh, and, and I guess that, that comes from, in my own life, a long sense of being involved with environmental uh, studies, uh, an ecological orientation towards environmental preservation. Uh, and my, my sense is that the more people appreciate and really come to love where they live and value their place, uh, then the more they will protect it and stand up for it. So this story, 
as part of our heritage, and and it's such a such a great story that it makes you think. I mean, we can go down here to to Lanes Creek, and we can look out. The head pond now covers the area where Tap Madney saw Peter Joe first building the birch bark canoe. But we can look right at the site and think about what happened there, and the result of that still active and alive in our our day now. That's that's sort of part of my perspective. A marker with red tape on it at the top of this lane. That's for his this lane over. led to Adney's cabin and Adney had a, a cord coming all the way down here. Before you went into his cabin, the cord was on a tree and he gave it a pull and it rang a bell because he often was in the nude and he didn't want you coming to see him. So this warned he could put his bathrobe on. I think it's important to recognize that even though Tapanetti didn't have letters after his name, I was talking to Connor Quinn, who was a modern day linguist, a young linguist, who looked at some of the work that Adney had in Peabody Essex Museum on his language studies. And Connor said that, you know, even though he didn't have letters after his name, there's a lot of material in there which is still valuable in, in the language. It's he, all this research work that he did, his conclusions may not follow modern day academic uh, research the way they would do it, or analysis of language, but all the stories of all the people that he interviewed and talked to about their old culture and their old ways and what they called this name and that name in, in the old language, he said, that's all very valuable information. Even though Adney may not have followed proper protocol for analysis, the information that he, that he gathered, thousands of pages of it, is there, and people should be looking at that because there's more, there's history and culture in there, not just language. So a lot of things that Adney did uh, uh, are not out of date, mm -hmm. they're, they're still valuable today. Don't, don't just put them aside because that's, that was done, you know, 100 years ago. In, in fact, I got an email yesterday from a graduate student at UNB who's doing her PhD on canoe routes in New Brunswick and she'd come across our book and there's a there's a reproduction of a page of his manuscript of Malice terminology for different places and and she wanted to track down where she could find more of that in information. So this is exactly an example of what Daryl's talking about, how this this work goes on. And there's a lot of material there that could still be brought out and worked with that would reveal even more of the significance of, of his of his research at that time. Great. This is a perfect spot to end. <laughs> this is what used to be here yeah. after he died. That's the first marker. Two of them, that's all that was there. And the First Nations people decided to, they said that they didn't feel this was sufficient for him. This is the, the Malice term for friend of the Malice. Actually, friend of the Wolaskagiak. Wolaskagiak. Thank you guys so much, and being in the Tapanadni room at the Connell House in Woodstock. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.